Thank you. So yeah, we're from Dartmouth Humanitarian Engineering. Uh, it's a student-run organization of about 50 active members. Uh, I'm Will, this is Anna and Rachel, and we have uh, two projects we're going to talk to you about today. So the first project, first, is this? Okay. the first project is hydropower, and that's based in Rwanda, and I'll be talking about that. And then Anna and Rachel will take over and start talking about bioenergy, bio which is based in Tanzania. Uh, so, the hydropower project began in 2007 when a group of Dartmouth humanitarian engineering students got together and said, you know, we want to start a new project, and we, but we don't know what it is. So they got together with the Wildlife Conservation Society in Rwanda, and together the Wildlife Conservation Society and a student named Ben, it's pictured here on the right, identified hydropower as a potential solution to some problems that they saw in Rwanda. So these problems were a lack of electricity in rural areas and also reliance on wood-based fuel for um, energy. And that reliance on wood-based fuel is leading to rapid deforestation in Rwanda. Um, so then Ben got excited about this project. Other Dartmouth Humanitarian Engineering students got excited about this project. And so he came back several months later to start surveying. And while um, in the lobby of his hotel, he met um, this man on the left, Rick. And Rick was working in the hotel at the time, but Rick is also a self-trained electrical engineer and incredibly passionate about Rwanda and incredibly knowledgeable about Rwanda. And when he heard about this project, um, he basically volunteered to show Ben around and help him find potential sites for hydropower. And so uh, the two of them together spent time identifying sites and we have implemented hydropower systems in many of those sites since then. And Rick has actually, in the years um, so after 2007 has remained an uh, important contact for our organization and actually still manages two of our sites to this day. Um, so going from the kind of overview of how we started to how hydropower works, um, you take a waterfall like this or a stream running down a, uh, or a stream running down a steep hillside and you divert part of that water and you bring it down into a kiosk like this. And so that water will come down and it will spin a turbine and that turbine is attached to a generator and that generator generates electri electricity which charges batteries. And those batteries can be distributed within a community. And so here you can see one of these systems being built. Um, right now they're in the process of diverting the water so that they can bring it down the hillside. Um, and there are several students in this photo along with Rwandan workers who are helping them. Um, and so in the process of implementing these sites, we've had three so far, we've kind of had this shift in um, kind of ideology. So we started out with this idea that we should be able to build everything completely locally and that everything needed to be able to be fabricated and repaired using local materials. But what we started to notice is that there are some items that even though we could make them locally, it was very difficult and they weren't very efficient and in addition, they didn't break very often. So it seemed like those items we didn't really need to build locally. We could almost bring them in and have them be more efficient and easier to make and not really get any of the faults that are associated with things breaking there because they really just don't break very often. So one of these items is the turbine. So the turbine itself is very robust. It's made out of metal pretty much any way you make it. Um, so the original turbine we had was made out of metal that was welded together and pipes that were cut apart and was significantly less efficient than this turbine. And this turbine is the product of a senior level engineering design class where Dartmouth Humanitarian Engineering gave engineers at Thayer School of Engineering parameters and said, here's the sort of turbine we need, can you make this for us? And after two quarters they came back with this turbine which is significantly more efficient across pretty much um, every set of parameters and you know has just improved our system overall quite a bit. And we don't know necessarily what parts we can do this with and what parts we can't. So we can't say like, oh, the electrical parts, we know we can build those here and bring them in. Um, the electrical parts fail pretty often. So that's one of those things where we have to keep like kind of testing to see, okay, what can we bring in and what do we have to make um, locally repairable? So that's kind of a challenge we're working with now, trying to make things as simple as possible, as repairable as possible. Um, and so I just like, I'd like to take a brief step back and just talk about impact for a second. 
Um, I think it's easy for us to kind of focus on the technological aspects of these projects and not think about what's actually happening uh, when they are implemented. So in this case, what happens when we give, when batteries go out into the communities after they're charged, people will bring them home to light up their homes, to read at night, do homework, or just you know stay awake past sunset. Um, people will also use them for their businesses. So there are cell phone charging businesses where people will um, just charge people small fees to charge their cell phones using their batteries. Uh, people use these batteries for barber shops. They run electric razors and hair trimmers off of these batteries. But I think the most exciting things are when people use these batteries for community events. So this photo right here is actually a photo of a church using these batteries to power their church service. So they have an electric keyboard and an electric guitar and a sound mixer all being powered off these batteries. And it's just, it's really exciting to see people enjoying the technology and, you know, seeing a real visible impact from it. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Anna and Rachel, and then we'll talk about bioenergy. Thanks, Will. All right, so as Will said, my name is Anna, and I'm working with the bioenergy project in DHE, which is sometimes affectionately known as the pyro project, because we deal a lot with kilns and things that light on fire. Um, the reason I first became involved with DHE was because at the heart of everything that we do, everything that we try and accomplish from today to day, is this innate understanding that we want to improve the world and we don't need to have a master's degree or even an undergraduate degree to start doing it. Um, so the bioenergy project specifically is working to create a smokeless alternative to wood as a fuel for um, stoves in developing countries, specifically Tanzania. But we definitely didn't start out this way. This project was originated seven years ago in a variety of different forms to what it is today, which is producing briquettes. Um, the thing about hearing other people's stories is while it's great to hear the success of what other people are doing, it's not quite as fun as listening to all the ways that they messed up. So today I'm gonna to share with you two of the ways that we messed up in the past seven years and what we've learned from that going forward. Starting out our work in Tanzania, we had a bunch of different types of projects. It was everything from purifying water using the sun, which is up in that corner, to using biogas to power homes, um, to the ever glamorous composting latrine project, <laughs> which actually went very well. The students in 2009 managed to make a composting latrine that worked. They installed it on a farm. The farmers were very interested in it. It was turning their excrement to fertilizer, so not quite lead into gold, but still effective. Um, and so the travelers went back to the US very satisfied with what they had done and very secure that they had improved the world in some way. They sent another assessment trip a few months later, which found that the farmers had stopped using the latrine altogether. I don't know if they were going in the bushes at that point, but the latrine was no longer in use. Um, so they were asking the farmers why this had happened. This, this composting latrine was effective. It was improving your lives. Why on earth are you no longer using it? And what they found from the farmers is that the farmers were afraid that if the surrounding community discovered where their miraculous fertilizer was coming from, they would stop buying their produce, uh, which is understandable. So that taught us a very important lesson that it's not only important that your design works, it's not only important that the people that you give it to works, but you have to question your assumptions of the surrounding community and make sure that communal perception is such that your product will be effective in the long run. Our second story is working with the cook stove project, which actually led almost directly to the current briquetting project that we're working on today. Um, the rocket stove is something that's worked on by many communities out around the world as an attempt to make a stove that will burn fuel more efficiently and with less smoke to decrease the respiratory issues in developing countries. Um, so we tried to make this product in a variety of ways. We had metal stoves, we had stoves from bricks, as you say here, and we were relatively successful. We knew that in Tanzania, coffee husks were often produced and wasted. So here at Thayer School, we were trying to make a rocket stove that would run on coffee husks. And we succeeded in doing that. We imported husks from Hawaii. We were using it to test our stove, and the stove worked. So we very happily went off to Tanzania, and we were ready to give our product and save the world. And then we discovered, we had an awful realization using our stove there, that the coffee husks in Tanzania were just different enough from the coffee husks from Hawaii that the stove no longer worked. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so that taught us to question our assumptions of what was existing in country and that you really is essential to be developing your designs in collaboration with the people in that community so that you don't run into issues of communal perception and that you're able to make a product that works with the materials that they actually have. And now I'm going to turn this over to Rachel who has some more recent developments on our project. So as Anna mentioned, we are now moving on to working with the fuel for stoves instead of working with stoves. So our technology is making briquettes, which are made out of um, charcoal dust, which is crushed into a bag of lumped charcoal. It's very similar. And it's used all over Tanzania. Another change in our, um, in our design as an organization is that we teach a process. We don't work with technologies very much and in the bioenergy group but we teach people how to make their own fuel from carbonization, from making the charcoal, to the end, to, making, to pressing the actual briquettes. The idea is that the project is then self-sustaining, that it doesn't need us to be there, that it's really about the community, that they make their own fuel. So this is all great, and, that, and we, love, we go to Tanzania, we work with our partners, we teach them what we know, and we come back to the US, and that, then they can continue the project in their own way. And, a lot of our work then becomes impact analysis, so understanding if what we've done is, has been effective, if it's had any change, any impact whatsoever in the community. So we collect interviews this way, we um, collect quantitative data, like how much fuel costs, so lump charcoal versus how much it costs to produce briquettes, um, which is good. So I had the opportunity last summer to travel to Tanzania with the group, and part of what we were doing was collecting impact analysis data on four of the groups that we'd worked with previously. And one of them was Lulu Vakoba, which was this group of women. And we were excited to go meet this group because the previous DHE group that had worked with them had already introduced the concept of briquetting. And we were excited to go back and see how this project had affected this group and you know, if they were still briquetting and how it was being used, that kind of thing. So we were excited to talk to them. But once we arrived in Tanzania, we heard from our contact that the Lulu Vakoba was no longer making briquettes, that they didn't work. So this was, this was disappointing because as a student group, we want success. We want to have a positive impact. Um, but we thought we'd, we were going to go to visit this group anyway to figure out what went wrong and what we could do better next time, you know, to improve what we, how we worked. So we go to the group. And they don't speak any English, it's just Swahili. So our, tr our contact, Naomi, is our translator. And our first question to the group is, you know, why did you stop making briquettes? What's, what went wrong? We, you know, we want to get to the root of the problem. And the women have this great five-minute long discussion in Swahili, back and forth. Everyone's engaged, everyone's having this debate. And this is good, okay, we're going to get some good data from this. I'm, I'm excited. And then Naomi gets back to us with one sentence. Um, the weather hasn't begun the past week. Okay, so, you know, that's one sentence. There was five minutes discussion. We're missing something here. It's a, it's a little weird. Okay, but we go back and forth a couple more times with more questions that we're asking and more answers we're getting back. And each time, the answers just don't make sense. They're talking about the weather. They're talking about, you know, it's raining a little bit. But they're not talking about the briquettes themselves. So we decide to go back to basics and ask, you know, the underlying question. So are you still making briquettes? Seems like an obvious first question to ask. And it turns out the answer comes back, yes, we are making briquettes. We make them every week. We love them. We use them all the time. So you know, that's, that's great to hear, but we could have reached this conclusion a lot earlier. We could have foregone, the we could have not assumed that what we heard from Naomi was the end all and be all, that we could have probed deeper and kind of understood what was going on in the group. So that was exciting. We heard that they're still making briquettes, they still work. So we decide to go next week to this group to watch them make briquettes to their briquetting session, just to see what was going on um, and kind of understand how it was working for their group. And we get there and you know, I was expecting this is their briquetting session, they're just going to be making briquettes. They're gonna pump out a lot of them, it's gonna be really exciting. But it turns out that this isn't their time just to make briquettes, it's their time to make briquettes, but also to make handicrafts to sell. In their, in their community to tourists. So it's a lot about what, we, what I learned, understanding the context that we're working in. So briquettes are great, that's what we focus on as a group, but they're not the end all and be all. They're not going to change everyone's lives. It's about trying to fit in this small technology into the context that people are already living in to 
kind of create another opportunity for people to use that improves their lives maybe in some small way, but doesn't completely change their whole world. So that's what we're working with in DHE, finding this, the opportunity to create small positive change. But well, well, we're not traveling. Um, in DHE, we're working on campus, so it's a completely student-run organization, which is awesome that we get to learn ourselves and make our own mistakes. So as we've heard from our stories, is we make a lot of mistakes, and we learn from them. And we're able to teach other students how not to make those same mistakes, so that they can make their own mistakes and move on and learn and do better in some small way every year. So that's DHE. Thank you very much.